Good morning. So this next lecture will be about the derivatives of the pharyngeal gut. I could also say that this is the first part of the development of the intestinal tract. Here now you see a shark because the pharyngeal gut, the Latin term for it is the branchial uh, gut, and branchia, that means gill, this territory is uh, the territory in fish which will give the gills. With shark it's interesting because these arches are well visible, it doesn't have a gill lid, so it's not covered like with the other fish. First we have to uh, recapitulate what we learned in the first semester regarding the flexion or the folding. This happens on the fourth week. Uh, we start with the trilaminar germ disc with the endoderm, mesoderm and the ectoderm. But soon the ectoderm uh, will show uh, the start of the neural plate, which then starts to close to neural tube. This means that an asymmetrical proliferation happens in this trilaminar germ disc, and this will cause the entire trilaminar germ disc to bend. With this, we will have the foregut and the hindgut and the midgut, which is in communication with the uh, York sac. If I'm showing you a model, a simple model, with, the, uh, with a glove, right? So here you see one layer, this would be the top layer would be the ectoderm, the bottom layer would be the endoderm, between the mesoderm, that's the gap. And if you look at this model, then we have an oval black line with two green spots. This green spot next to the red one, this is the oropharyngeal membrane, and the other one is the cloaca membrane. Between the oropharyngeal membrane and the edge of the trilaminar germ disc, there is the heart primordium that is marked with a red spot. So that this plate would correspond to our first picture. And as the neural uh, uh, plate closes to neural tube between the two green spots, that is the oropharyngeal membrane and the cloaca membrane, that will cause the asymmetrical proliferation. So the top layer will grow much faster, and this will cause the whole structure to bend. With this, we will have a foregut, and you see that the heart is now already on the ventral surface of the, uh, of the embryo, and this will be the hindgut, where my other thumb is, uh, that is closed by the uh, cloaca membrane. The red line, which is originally at the edge of the tri flat trilaminar germ disc, this will get to the ventral side, and later this will be the territory of the umbilical ring, where the ectoderm, which gives the stratified squamous keratinizing epithelium, uh, will uh, have a transitional line to the surface of the umbilical cord, which is only a cuboidal epithelium. So please try to review this and remember what we studied in the first semester. So now we have this rudimentary uh, endodermal tube, the rudimentary endodermal gut tube. Uh, we have a foregut, foregut, a midgut, and a hindgut. Uh, the foregut is closed anteriorly by the oropharyngeal membrane, and from the foregut we will have then several segments of the intestinal tract. This upper part is the pharyngeal uh, gut, uh, then comes the uh, esophagus and the stomach, and the foregut ends at two-thirds of the duodenum. So here you see the derivatives, but before uh, it, uh, it ends by the two-thirds of the duodenum, it will have outgrowth, and this will give the liver, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. Liver, gallbladder, and the pancreas are given also by the endoderm of the foregut. The foregut itself is only an endodermal tube. It gives, it gives rise, the endoderm gives rise only, only, only to the inner lining, the epithelial lining of the gut, and the glands which are opening into it. All the connective tissue elements and muscle elements and blood vessels, those come uh, from the visceral layer of the lateral plate mesoderm. Also, uh, the material, the epithelial elements, of the larynx, trachea, and lungs. These are coming, these are growing out also from the foregut. Uh, there is a border between the foregut and the midgut and the midgut and the hindgut. Of course, this is not a red line uh, if you are looking at the developing embryo, but you will see it when you study the blood supply of the abdominal viscera that uh, the blood vessels will strictly keep these borders. So it will be interesting to compare embryology uh, with the anatomy. 
From this midgut, first a so-called physiological umbilical hernia will develop because the, the, uh, the gut tube is, is too big, the abdominal wall is yet not that big, not enough big, and uh, uh, this will hang out from the body later as the ventral body wall also expands, then this will be pulled back at the end of the second month, this will be pulled back to the true abdominal cavity and then the anterior body wall will close. Uh, the oropharyngeal membrane or buccopharyngeal membrane, both terms are correct, oropharyngeal or buccopharyngeal membrane will break through at the 21st day, so at the beginning of the fourth, third, uh, end of third, third week, beginning of the fourth week, and the cloaca membrane uh, that will uh, rupture at the end of the ninth week. Please don't forget this figure I showed you already in the previous semester. This is the basics, the very basics of the embryology, and it would help you a lot uh, to understand that what, what is the origin of the different organs, that our body is a tube, which starts at the oral cavity, ends with the anus. In between, we have a complicated tube. The inner lining of this uh, tube plus the, uh, the glands which are opening into it, those are derived from the endoderm. All connective tissue and muscle elements, they come from the mesoderm, and on the surface we again have an epithelial lining, stratified squamous keratinizing epithelium with the appropriate uh, glands, and the, and the hair, those are uh, derived from the ectoderm. So we are like a sandwich, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. This is again a little bit of recapitulation. You saw these figures in the previous figure, but now we start to concentrate already on the pharyngeal arches. So on the fourth week, you see here the embryo with the open anterior and the posterior neuropore, which in a few days they will close. And you also see that the heart primordium is relatively big, and with the folding it is already on the ventral surface of the body. Uh, you see at this stage, in the middle of the fourth week, you see two of the pharyngeal arches, which by the end of the uh, uh, fourth week will increase to three visible arches already, plus we have a frontal process. About these processes, you've heard already uh, in connection with the development of the face, because the frontal process and the first pharyngeal arch, which will have a sub, pardon, a subpart, so it will, the first pharyngeal arch will divide into the mandibular and the maxillary uh, process. These processes, together with the frontal process, will give uh, the structure, the basic structure of the face. Uh, and these processes, they border a cavity, which we call the stomodium. That's the primitive oral cavity. Later, uh, this will, uh, will uh, be united first with the nasal cavity and then divided again by the palates from the nasal cavity. Uh, on, the, on the surface, we also see here spots in the head region. These are the placodes. Placodes are thickenings of the ectoderm. Review it from the first semester material. Here you see the lens placode, which gives the lens, so not the entire eye, but only the lens. And here you see the ear placode, and that will give the, the uh, membranous labyrinth. Uh, also, the uh, limb primordia are visible here at the end of the fifth week. This is what you heard in the previous lecture, phase development with the frontal process, medial and lateral nasal process, maxillary process, and mandibular process. They will unite. So upper lip that's for, formed from the philtrum, that's the derivative of the frontal process and the maxillary process. And this is here, the lower lip and this um, jaw territory is given by the mandibular arch. And if we look at uh, the face of Julia Roberts, then this territory is, uh, comes from the frontal process. It's innervated by the first division of the trigeminal nerve. This territory comes from the maxillary process, innervated by the maxillary nerve. and. This territory is uh, coming from the mandibular process, subpart of the first pharyngeal arch, and it's innervated by the mandibular nerve. Okay, so we had these pictures here, and this is a schematic picture which shows you here the neural tube and the pharyngeal uh, gut and the stomodeum and the buccopharyngeal or oropharyngeal membrane. If I project this picture onto this picture, Right, uh, and you uh, imagine that we will, would make a, a sagittal cut, then I could put my th finger through the, mid, uh, through the York sac to the mid gut and I could push it forward, theoretically, to the or oropharyngeal membrane. So at this time, 
this whole system, this endodermal tube, is yet communicating with the yolk sac. Now imagine another cut, uh, line of cut, a frontal cut. And on the next picture, you will see the anterior part of this pharyngeal gut. Here at the end, you see already the uh, lung bud. But if we cut it like this, and we lift off this anterior part, and we look at the inner surface of this cut part or from the inside like a shield, then we would see the following. Right? We would see here on the edge the cut of the pharyngeal arches. So these are here the arches. We have all together, by number we have six arches, but the fifth is missing. So we have only fifth arches, but we number it like one, two, three, four, and six. So first, second, third, fourth, and sixth. There is no fifth pharyngeal arch. These are the arches. Uh, between the arches, these thinner territories on the inside, on the inside we call them uh, pouches, pharyngeal uh, pouches. Again, a synonym would be the branchial pouch, but the branchial that refers to the gill because this has to do something with the gill of the fish. Uh, so this is here the pharyngeal pouch. On the external surface, these are here the pharyngeal clefts. And the inner surface is lined by endoderm, the outer surface is lined by ectoderm, and where these two touch each other, that is the so-called uh, obturant membrane, membrana obturans. Here you see it on a scanning electron microscopic picture, that, a picture that the two epithelial layers, they are in contact with each other. In human and in mammalians, uh, the, these two epithelial layers uh, 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 will have some connective tissue in, in between them later, and that allows that they will not be resorbed. But in fish, it will be resorbed, and that's how you get the gills uh, with the fish. Uh, okay, so this is then here endoderm, this is here ectoderm. The inner surface of the first arch is also covered by ectoderm. We will see this with the uh, tongue development, because the bucopharyngeal membrane is along this line. About. So this anterior territory is at the territory of the stomodeum and the inner surface of the first pharyngeal arch. Uh, the, the arches are filled with mesenchyme, so-called ectomesenchyme. That's why we call it ectomesenchyme, because partially it comes from the mesoderm and partially it comes from the neural crest. So neural crest, that's a miraculous piece of tissue closed out from the neural tube uh, ectoderm, and uh, in the head and neck region, it contributes to the uh, mesenchymal tissue formation together with the mesoderm, and this will be called the ectomesenchyme. Within this ectomesenchyme, uh, among others, there will be always an artery, a nerve, and a cartilage. The nerves are very important to know that for which uh, arch, which nerve is uh, connected, because these nerves will innervate all the derivatives of that particular pharyngeal arch. So the nerve of the first arch, that's the fifth, pharynge uh, fifth uh, cranial nerve, the second, that's the facial, the third, that's the ninth, the glossopharyngeal, and for the fourth and the sixth arch, two branches of the vagus nerve uh, will give uh, the innervation. This group of nerves, uh, it's worth to remember them like this. So these are the pharyngeal arch nerves, and you will see it in the next semester with neuroanatomy. In neuroanatomy, that they have a lot of similarities in their built-up and their, and their uh, central nervous system structure. Okay. So uh, these are nice pictures which help you imagine how this looks like. So here you see the bucopharyngeal membrane, uh, the foregut, uh, the pharyngeal gut part of it. Here you see the lung primordium. Right? And these pouches, these out pockets, they uh, symbolize uh, the pharyngeal pouches. Between the pouches, here you see blood vessels, arteries connected. These are the arteries which are embedded into the pharyngeal arches. Right? These arteries will be the aortic arches. And about the development of the, uh, of the arterial system, you will hear at the end of the semester. So please, at the end of the semester, connect those arteries with the final pharyngeal arches and try to combine this knowledge. Also, you see how here the nerves, uh, they grow into the arches. And as I told you, these nerves, it's worth to remember because it's enough to remember one thing. If you know that the second pharyngeal arch nerve is the facial nerve, then you know that which, uh, all those structures which are innervated by the facial nerves, they must develop from the second pharyngeal arch. 
or if you know that the, the for, for example, the muscles of facial expression they, uh, they develop from the second pharyngeal arch, then you know that this must be innervated by the facial nerve. So some, something you must know, but you can uh, combine your knowledge and strengthen it with these connections. Yes, this is just uh, something interesting about the fish. So here you see the gills of the fish, because with fish, this membrana obturantis, this Two, uh, two closing membranes between uh, endoderm and ectoderm, they break through. So the fish will suck in the water and press it out in between uh, the arches of the uh, gills, which have a lot of uh, blood vessels, and it's, it's very richly capillarized, capillarized. And with this, they can get out the oxygen from the, blood, uh, from the water that is uh, uh, flowing through uh, the lamellae of the, uh, of the gills. Uh, the, from the second pharyngeal arch, there is a plate growing down. This, is, this will be the uh, gill lid, and uh, the fish can pump with it, and with this they can uh, increase the flow of the water. Sharks, they don't have uh, gill lid. That's why they have to swim all the time to get enough oxygen. Uh, you would think that this, is not, this has nothing to do with human embryology, this operculum, but you will see it soon that Humans, they also have, at a certain point of their life, an operculum. So remember this plate here, please. OK, and you also heard in the first weeks already about the development of the respiratory tract. The respiratory tract, the lower part, so the, from the larynx uh, distally, that also develops from the pharyngeal gut endoderm. It's that, that is that lung bud out, out, out pocket, which I already showed you uh, in a previous picture. And it's worth to think through the evolution that how, how did we get a lung? So first there were this very small unicellular or, or just a few cell structures when the oxygen was absorbed through the body surface because that was yet enough. But when the body surface wasn't yet enough, and you know that life uh, uh, formed in, in water surrounding, and when this body surface was already not enough, then a vascularized tissue was in, connect, in connection with the oxygen containing fluid. And that, that was uh, the gill. And when we climbed out from water, then we still needed oxygen. And we have to de had to develop a large surface, which has a simple epithelium on, the surf on, on, its inner, on its surface, which allows the diffusion of the gases in one and other direction. But this cannot be on the surface, because then it would dry out Im immediately. So, so actually, uh, the lungs are an inner humidified gas exchange mechanism. It has a large inner surface and this tubular system uh, till it gets down to your uh, simple uh, uh, squamous epithelial lined alveoli. It will be humidified with the glands and with the, with the humidity of the mucous membranes of the pharynx, of the nasal cavity first, then the pharynx, then the trachea, and the bronchi. Okay. Yeah, I know what I wanted to tell you, that in fish, you know that fish, they have that gas bladder, which allows them to float in the water. So actually, that gas bladder is a rudimentary mini lung. There are some fish which live in moors, and uh, they, have some, they may have some vascularization in the wall of these, uh, these uh, gas bladders, and they may survive periods without water, because they can gain also with a different method already oxygen. And I told you that the aortic arches will be discussed later, so you will see these pictures later, and it will be then explained. But now let's continue the topics about the pharyngeal arches. So as I told you, this is a general information. The external surface is, is covered by ectoderm. The inner surface is covered by endoderm, with the exception of the inner surface of the first pharyngeal arch. And they are filled with mesenchyme, which is an ectomesenchyme, partially from the paraxial mesoderm and from the neural crest. Uh, from this mesenchyme, we will have uh, the muscles, also skeletal muscles, paraxial mesoderm, also in this region, will have myotome cells. So these myotome cells, they can give the uh, skeletal muscle uh, elements, connective tissue, cartilage, and among others, also the dentin will develop from this ectomesenchyme. The arteries, we will discuss them later, but it's always in the pharyngeal arch, so we will, we will not talk, them, talk about the arteries today. That will be a later topic. And the nerves, which innervates the structures that you must know that which nerve is connected to which pharyngeal arch. 
This picture, it also shows you some basic terms. We will not ask this information in, the, in so much detail as I show it on this picture. We, I would like you to only to understand that what are these terms, because I see always a confusion in the exam with these terms. Uh, part of the confusion is that, that there is always this M-E-R, mer, uh, syllable at the end of the words, and this makes it uh, similar, and it's difficult for you at this level to make a difference between them. So we have the neural tube. You know that the, in the spinal cord we have segments. These are called neuromeres in general, but those neuromeres which extend into the brainstem, into the rhombencephalon, those will be called the rhombomeres. So the rhombomeres are segments of the neural tube in the brainstem. Now, as the neural tube closes, we discussed that a piece of tissue uh, will, uh, will be closed out both from the skin ectoderm and both from the neural uh, plate ect ectoderm, and that will be the neural crest. So along this territory, along the uh, brainstem, we will have also a line of tissue uh, of the neural crest. Uh, this neural crest will, in, will uh, partially migrate into the mesenchyme of the pharyngeal arches, and with this it will give the ectomesenchyme and partially the ganglia of the cranial nerves are also uh, derived from this neural crest. Also placodes uh, may yet contribute to these uh, ganglia, but that will be a different story. We will discuss it in detail in the next semester. So we had the neural tube with the rhombomeres. Next to it we have the neural crest, and laterally from it we have the paraaxial mesoderm, and the paraaxial mesoderm in the upper and in the cranial uh, region doesn't fall apart into small balls of tissue. We call those the somitomeres, and when they already form these tissue balls, then we call them the somites. So somitomeres and somites are part of the paraxial mesoderm, and you learned it in the previous semester that this has b three big subparts. It has the uh, dermatome, it has the myotome, and it has the sclerotome part. Right? All these parts will participate in the formation of the head and neck structures. Of course, all these processes are regulated by Hox genes and uh, by the transcription, fac transcription factors, which are coded by the Hox genes and then the homeobox genes in general. And now we will discuss the individual uh, derivatives of these pharyngeal arches. The first pharyngeal arch is the mandibular arch, and as we told, it has a sub, a two, two subparts. It has the mandibular process and the maxillary process. Uh, it has a, a piece of cartilage in it. This is the Meckel's cartilage, which disappears. Actually, around the Meckel cartilage, with desmal ossification, the mandibula will develop. Only the proximal end will turn into little bones, and these will be two of the auditory ossicles, the malleus and the incus. Malleus and the incus, those are the remnants of the uh, Meckel, Meckel, uh, Meckel's cartilage. Uh, and when we talk about the arches, you might think that, okay, this, as this is something that is uh, left in embryology, but just think it over, that everything in this upper uh, head territory is arch form. So you have your maxilla, then the zygomatic bone, and the zygomatic arch, right? This is once one beam. Then you have your mandibula, that's another beam. You have your hyoid bone, that's also a beam. And the laryngeal cartilages, those are also uh, beam-shaped or ring-shaped. So these, are, these, are, these have their shapes uh, because of the original arch structure. Okay, so what are the bony derivatives of the first pharyngeal arch? It's the maxilla, the mandibula, the zygomatic bone, uh, uh, the, uh, the squamous portion of the temporal bone with the zygomatic uh, process. Uh, the two, uh, 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 this arch, the zygomatic arch, and these bones which form this, this territory, that's called the, the zygoma, uh, this, uh, or zygoma. Uh, this uh, this uh, may also have uh, malformation problems, this territory. And also a ligament, which is the phenomandibular ligament. So all these bones, these form by desmal ossification. The nerve of the arch is the trigeminal nerve will give a lot of uh, skin innervation, mucous membrane innervation, but also innervates the muscles of mastication, 
Uh, you have to know the names only in this semester, the function and the exact origin and insertion we will ask in the next semester. So you have the masseteric muscle, you have the temporal muscle, and the internal and external uh, pterygoid muscle, or medial and lateral pterygoid muscle, that's also used as a name. Uh, so the muscles of mastication are these four muscles, plus the mylohyoid, the digastric, and uh, and the ventral anterior, uh, the tensor tympani and the tensor veli palatini muscles, these are all innervated by the trigeminal. Remember the two tensors, those are innervated by the trigeminal nerve. The second pharyngeal arch is called the hyoid arch, and there is the so-called Reichert's cartilage in it. Uh, the Reichert cartilage uh, uh, will give uh, the upper part, upper half of the hyoid bone and the lesser horn. This is the distal end of it. And the proximal end will give the styloid process. Uh, the styloid process at the end, we list it with the parts of the temporal bone. Please remember that the temporal bone has many different parts. So it has the petrous part, it has the squamous part, it has the hyoid part. This is the styloid process and it has the tympanic part. So this styloid process, which is at the end a part of the temporal bone, originally didn't have to do anything with the skull, it just stuck on it extra. And it depends how long it gets ossified, it may be shorter or longer, because between the uh, hyoid bone and the uh, styloid process, uh, we have a ligament, uh, which is the, uh, the stylohyoid ligament. Do, we, do I have it here on my picture? Maybe I don't have it. So it's the stylohyoid ligament, and, and the length of the styloid process uh, depends on this level of ossification. Normally it's three, four centimeters long, but we saw already skulls on which it was 10 centimeters long. It's a long hook, hooked uh, bony process. Okay. Uh, so the nerve of the, of the second pharyngeal arch is the facial nerve, which as a main attraction innervates the muscles of facial expression plus the posterior belly of the digastric muscle, the stapedius, musculus stapedius. It's no miracle because from the most proximal end of this arch also the stapes, the third auditory ossicle, uh, develops, and the stylohyoid muscle, which is a muscle uh, which uh, has its origin on the styloid process. I just mentioned it, but I will show it later, that from the mass of the second pharyngeal arch, the operculum will grow down. You really remember, that's the thing what we call fish, in fish, the, uh, the gill lid. Okay, uh, the third pharyngeal arch, which is marked here with yellow color, that gives the greater horn of the hyoid bone and the lower half of the body. The nerve for this arch is the glossopharyngeal nerve, and uh, the, uh, this innervates the stylopharyngeal muscle. Uh, the fourth and the sixth pharyngeal arch, and please remember that there is no fifth arch, right? The fourth and the sixth, uh, these will be give the connective tissue and the cartilages of the larynx. The nerve will be the vagus nerve. You already studied in anatomy that we have a superior laryngeal and an inferior laryngeal nerve. Uh, the met, uh, the uh, muscles in this arch uh, will give the muscles of the larynx, plus the constrictor pharyngeal uh, muscles and the levator veli palatini muscle. And these are also all innervated by the vagus nerve. Okay. Okay, now we will discuss the derivatives of the pharyngeal pouches. As I told you, the pouches are lined with endoderm, except for the inner surface of the first. Right, and we have four pouches. One, two, three, four the third and the fourth that has a ventral and a dorsal uh, wing. Uh, from the first pouch, the middle ear, middle ear, the auditory tube will develop, and because the middle ear develops from here, also the inner plate of the eardrum will develop from this first pharyngeal pouch. Uh, you met already this in the uh, dissecting room because you, in the pharynx, in the nasopharynx, uh, you saw the pharyngeal opening of the auditory tube. So that is this point. This is here, the pharyngeal opening of the auditory tube in the nasopharynx. Uh, the second pouch uh, will be invaded by lymphocytes, and this will be the palatine tonsil. So it gives the palatine fossa, but once it's already invaded by the uh, lymphocytes, then we have there the, uh, the palatine tonsil. 
On this scanning electron microscopic picture, you see here these pouches. And also on this picture, I would like to show you yet uh, that actually this and this picture, these are uh, two different stages, but only one side. So this would be here the midline. And in this case, I will project you here the other side. So this is here the cavity of the pharyngeal gut on both sides lined with endoderm. And of course, these pouches are symmetrical on both sides. And on the surface, on the external surface, we have the ectodermal lining. OK, so then let's go to the third and the fourth uh, pharyngeal pouch. The third, the one has a ventral wing, this one, which is marked here with red. This will give the thymus. And as the thymus migrates down, it will pull along the dorsal wing territory from which the parathyroid gland develops. But from the third, we will have the inferior parathyroid because this migrates further down than the next one. So this will be at the inferior parathyroid gland. In the fourth, we also have a ventral and a dorsal wing. The dorsal wing will give the superior parathyroid gland. So altogether, we have four parathyroid glands. These are small. Uh, it's about a pepper size uh, small gland embedded on the posterior surface of the thyroid gland. And it will produce the so-called parathormone, which will raise the calcium levels. It brings out the, uh, the uh, calcium from the bones, and it, with it, it, it will increase the, uh, the calcium level in the uh, blood. Uh, the ventral part of the fourth pouch, which was in earlier books called the, uh, the fifth pouch, but it's actually it's better, it's a better name if you call it the ventral side of the fourth pharyngeal pouch, uh, that will give the so-called ultimo branchial body. Ultimo, that means last, the branchial, that refers to this branchial gut, part of the gut, so the pharyngeal gut, you remember the term gill, ultimo branchial body. In some creatures, this is an extra little organ. In human, uh, these cells, they migrate in, into, the, uh, uh, into the thyroid gland and will form the so-called parafollicular C cells. They are derived from the endoderm under influence of the neural crest. And these cells will produce the so-called calcitonin, which will decrease the calcium level. So close to each other, we have two hormonal systems which increase and decrease uh, the calcium levels. Now, what will develop from the pharyngeal clefts? Originally, we have four pharyngeal clefts, and all, or, all of these are covered by the ectoderm. Uh, until the last edition of the Langman book, of the English edition of the uh, last English edition of the Langman book, we told uh, that from the first pharyngeal cleft, the external auditory tube and the external surface of the eardrum will develop. But the newer data show that the, actually the first pharyngeal cleft disappears and the secondary invagination from the surface will give the external auditory tube plus the external surface uh, of the eardrum. So there is no difference in that, that of course the external auditory meatus and the external surface of the eardrum uh, that is coming from the ectoderm, just not directly from the, this first uh, pharyngeal cleft. Uh, this is the remnant of one, more or like a remnant of, a, of, the, f of the first uh, uh, membrane obturans. Right? So if you would be a fish, you could suck in water into your mouth, press it into your nasal nasopharynx, then uh, get it through the auditory tube, middle ear, and you could spray it out through your ear. And that's why if you take a, a bony skull, you can uh, put your sonda through the external auditory meatus into the middle ear because there is no eardrum. Right? So think about the position of the eardrum, about the ear in detail, we will learn in the third semester. The material of the second pharyngeal arch will have a process, a long process. This will be the operculum. And the operculum will cover the, the second, the third, and the fourth pharyngeal cleft. Plus from the sixth here, this is here the territory of the sixth pharyngeal arch. From the sixth, we have a so-called epicardial ridge, uh, ridge, pardon, epicardial ridge here. That is going upward. So these two ridges, they are gro growing uh, uh, against each other, and they will 
cl get close to each other, and as they get close to each other, this uh, territory, which we call the cervical uh, sinus, the cervical sinus will get will get smaller, 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 and at the end it disappears. It should disappear fully. If it doesn't disappear fully, then a so-called cervical cyst may remain in the in the neck territory, and that's already a small malformation. With the term epicardial ridge, and that I'm telling that it comes from the six pharyngeal arch, you might think that, okay, how does the heart get here? The heart is so far, really far from the pharynx territory. But please remember that in each of these arches, we had an artery, and the artery of the six pharyngeal arch is the pulmonary artery. So then you, are, you, you can feel already that you are not that far from the heart. The artery of the six arch, will give uh, a, a, a side branch of it is the pulmonary artery, so the heart is closed. Don't forget it, please. Now, on this picture, now you see the, uh, this, this malformation, uh, the cervical cyst that may, how, how, where may it appear, depending whether it's the remnant of the second, the third, or the fourth pharyngeal cleft. It's a diff it may be at different levels at the anterior surface, of the, uh, close to the anterior surface of the sternocleidomastoid uh, muscle. We call this the lateral cervical cyst, or we may call it also the branchiogen, right? This refers again to the gill, branchiogen cysts. Sometimes, sometimes it's a cyst in the depth, like you see it here, and sometimes it may have a connection to the surface, then it's a fistula. This may be outward, or it may be inward. If it's inward, then in most cases it opens into the tonsillar fossa. Of course, theoretically it may be that it goes through, that it has an inner opening, it has also an outer opening. Uh, the cyst is usually dormant until the end of the teenage years, and at the end of the teenage years uh, it starts to proliferate and can symptoms uh, produce, like you see it on these patients. So this is a cervical cyst here. It has to be removed surgically, and the surgeons have to be careful to remove all these cells which are linked to this cervical cyst because all these embryologic remnants, they have a tendency to, to regrow if they are not fully and perfectly uh, removed. Uh, we told about the material of the pharyngeal arches, that they are connected to neural crest migration, so the ectomesenchyme needs the proper migration of the neural crest cells. And you will see that a certain part of the heart, a septum, is also uh, connected to neural crest mi uh, mig uh, migration, the secondary heart field that will need also neural crest cells. So uh, this, this, this is the explanation for that, that often facial malformations are connected with heart malformations. So if you see on a patient a facial malformation, uh, then you have to think about the heart, that the, height, uh, the heart might be also involved. And now our topic will be the, uh, the development of the tongue. Right? Uh, please remember that I told you with the first picture that the buccopharyngeal membrane, I don't know, I don't have the line here now. So the buccopharyngeal membrane is fixed here between the first and the second pharyngeal arch on the inside. So the anterior two-third of the tongue, that is of ectodermal origin, it has uh, three anlages. This is the tuberculum lingue laterale, lateral lingual swelling, and there is a, a tuberculum lingue in par, an unpaired uh, lingual swelling. These three territories will fuse and give the anterior two-third of the tongue. Uh, the mid territories of the second, third, and fourth arches in the midline, they will fuse each other and they will form the copula. The material of the third arch will overgrow uh, the second. So the second kind of disappears, but it doesn't disappear fully because you know that it, it sneaks into the anterior territories as the taste buds, for example, and the, uh, the glands of the tongue, those will be innervated by the facial nerve, so they must be derived from the second uh, material of the second pharyngeal arch. Uh, but since the anterior two-third is coming from the first pharyngeal arch, that will be innervated on the surface by the trigeminal nerve. Uh, the taste buds and the glands are innervated by the facial nerve because of this uh, material sneaking through. 
and uh, the, the territory which is behind the buccopharyngeal membrane, that uh, it will be the root of the tongue. This united territory is called the copula. Right? And this territory will be innervated by the, by the uh, nerve of the third pharyngeal arch, which is the glossopharyngeal nerve. From the fourth, we have here already the epiglottis swelling. And that, or, that is already the territory of the larynx. Uh, along this fusion line, uh, we have the papillae valati. And behind it, we have the foramen sucum. That is also the origin for a further a structure. The, a thyroid gland, I will explain it on the next uh, picture. Now, because the, uh, the buccopharyngeal membrane is standing kind of like obliquely, so like it's at, it, it would be behind the coanae, about at the facial isthmus, and, uh, and it runs anteriorly along the side of the, lung, uh, of the tongue. So the vestibulum moris, that's ectodermal, but the sublingual territory, that's already endodermal. So the vestibulum moris territories, uh, uh, to which uh, the uh, parotid gland uh, also opens. Those are ectodermal. Because of this, then the, the parotid gland is also ectoderm, of ectodermal origin. And the, uh, the sublingual and submandibular glands, which open to the sublingual territory, those are of endodermal origin. And, are, uh, and uh, yeah, so those are uh, mixed salivary glands in opposite to the parotid gland, which is only which has only serous alveoli. The skeletal muscles of the tongue, skeletal muscles, they always come from the, uh, from the somites, from the uh, myotome parts of the somites. There is no exception. So you, for skeletal muscle, you must have uh, somites and in the, or, or somitomeres, and in these, you must have the myotome cells. So these, uh, this musculature, skeletal musculature of the tongue comes from the four occipital somites, and it will be innervated by the 12th cranial nerve, which we call the hypoglossal nerve. Please do not mix the glossopharyngeal with the hypoglossal nerve. Right? These are different nerves. And here you can follow the development of the tongue on true preparations. Uh, these are scanning electron microscopic uh, pictures. You can see the same thing in natural surrounding as what I showed you on the sketches. Uh, on this last uh, picture, I would like to explain the development of the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is endodermal. Uh, it starts from the uh, foramen circum, which is right behind the buccopharyngeal membrane. Right from here, uh, an uh, epi epithelial bud grows down. Uh, this is the thyroglossal duct along the tongue, root of the tongue, and on the anterior part of the neck. And it migrates down uh, to the lower, lower end of the larynx. And as it goes down, it will divide into two parts. It will have two lobes and a connecting portion, which we, which we call isthmus. Sometimes the distal part of this uh, thyroglossal duct will remain, and that will give a, a pyramidal lobe. So this is called a pyramidal lobe. And uh, this, I would call not a malformation, rather a, a variation. But that's already a minor malformation if along the, this line of migration, tissue islets uh, remain. Uh, sometimes this may be embedded into the hyoid bone. Uh, why is this important medically? Because the scattered tissue islets uh, these may have the same, uh, same uh, diseases like the thyroid gland itself, so they may have hyperfunction uh, that may cause a problem, or they may have tumors or uh, other diseases. So this is an important thing to know, that thyroid gland, thyroid tissue, is not always only in the thyroid uh, gland. Okay. So thank you for your attention, and about the parafollicular C cells we already told before.